So uh, yeah, welcome to the second term. Happy New Year! And uh, we are opening the semester with a bang. Uh, Freddy will tell us about the polynomial Feynman Ruler conjecture. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you for the introduction. Thank you for the invitation to speak. Um, and uh, yeah, I should say for anything else that everything I'm going to talk about is uh, joint work with Tim Gowers, uh, Ben Green, and Gary Powell. Um, so uh, yeah, I want to talk about the the polynomial Feynman root conjecture. Um, and before I yeah. talk about that, sort of uh, get into the weeds, I want to give some motivation for, for the polynomial Feynman root conjecture and why you might care. Um, and uh, one of the great things about the polynomial Feynman root conjecture is that there are many equivalent formulations of it. Um, and I want to be slightly controversial and tell you about a non standard formulation of the polynomial Feynman root conjecture first, because I think it's the easiest to see why it's a, a natural statement. Um, so in order to, yeah, let me give some motivation. So, uh, yeah, in order to do that, um, I want to talk about proximate homomorphisms. So let's take uh, G1 and G2, uh, two finite Boolean groups. And I'm going to take some function f. G1 to D2. And uh, I'll try and draw an enormous table, see how it goes. Uh, so, firstly, I can say what it means for F to be a homomorphism. Not controversial. Uh, and that's just saying that for all X and Y, if D1, uh, F of X plus Y. It's f of x plus f of y. Okay. And uh, that's okay. Everyone knows what a homomorphism looks like. Um, so one thing you can ask is, what if instead of insisting that this condition, this homomorphism condition happens for every pair x and y in, in G1, what if it just happens for most pairs x and y? So I have a sort of rough homomorphism condition. Uh, so let's say f is a 99% homomorphism, or a sort of almost homomorphism. If uh, yeah, if this condition holds for almost all pairs, or if I want to phrase it in terms of probability, let's say that if I choose x and y uniformly random from G one, then the probability that this condition holds is at least uh, one minus epsilon, some small epsilon. Think of epsilon as being one over hundred or something. Um, and then the question is. Uh, what does that look So what can you say about the structure of that? Uh, so close to being a homomorphism in this sense, uh, is it close to being a homomorphism in any other sense? What, what examples are there? Um, and just to complete the picture, so I could also say F is a 1% homomorphism. Um, or sort of a bit, sort of barely a homomorphism at all. Uh, if exactly the same condition is true, but with uh, probability that yeah, this condition is satisfied for sort of 1% of the pairs x and y. So the probability that f of x plus y is equal to f x plus y is at least 1 in 100, say. What can you say about f then? Um, I don't know if you are going to say this in terms of uh, computer science lingo. The first case, the 99% is called the unique decoding regime, and the 1% is a list decoding regime. Thank you. Our, yeah. I did not know that language, so that's that's helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, in the first case, the true homomorphism you have would be unique, but not in the second case. Yeah, exactly. And that's why it's called unique decoding yeah. and list decoding. Yeah. In the second case, it may be that you have a hundred different ones that all have this problem. And is there a reason you took the group to be a B? Yeah. Um you can ask the same question for non-abelian groups, uh, but my methods won't tell you very much about it. So, um, but yeah, it's still a very much an interesting question, but it's much harder. Yeah, um, people studied it. Uh, because the, the reason I was interested is that in something much rougher, you have a theorem for Lie group that if something is the homomorphism up to mother zero, then it will be, but that's an abelian is not needed. Also. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's so this this ninety nine percent question. Yeah, you can think of this as as 
it's, it's a measure zero, but like a, a measure one homomorphism. Um, and you can say that, yeah, this is just a, then non-abelian would be fine. We, we know lots about this question. For this question, non-abelian is, is much harder. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, okay, yeah, so, uh, so I should say what, what the statement is. So, so for this one, you know, a natural way to find such a function is to start with a genuine homomorphism and then to mess around with 1% of the entries. Um, and that turns out to be the only thing you can do. So the, uh, if this holds, then there exists some genuinely linear, uh, genuinely genuine homomorphism. Um, and uh, it agrees with F on most of its values. Uh, so, so yeah, if you're, uh, if you're almost a homomorphism in this sense, then you're almost a homomorphism in this sense. Um, and uh, so it would be natural to ask in this case, uh, is it, if you're a little bit of a homomorphism in this sense, do you agree with a genuine homomorphism a little bit of the time? Is that the only way it can happen? Is it true that there exists by G1 to G2, which is a genuine homomorphism such that this probability uh, is at least, I don't know, some function of delta. Bounded below in terms of delta. Um, the first one is just a multiple of epsilon. You don't yeah. have anything more. Yeah. Yes, yeah. So as it happens, you can get linear bounds here. Yeah. I mean, if this was just some function of epsilon, it would still be interesting. But but uh, yeah, so so this this middle rep question, and this is true. Um, and with sort of all of the weapons of modern additive combinatorics at our disposal, we have nothing to fear from this question. So uh, this is this is happy. Um, there are two different forms, one combinatorial and one Fourier theoretical, and they're both simple. Right, they're sort of, when they were discovered, you know, without the benefit of hindsight, then, yeah, there's, it's non-trivial, um, for sure, but, uh, yeah, both, both proofs can be fixed on a couple of pages or something, uh, and, and the bounds are as good as you can hope for. Um, but this, this question is, is much more difficult um, by comparison. So, uh, yeah, the 1% the regime is significantly harder. Um, and uh, TV, one idea why this question is harder is, um, well, one reason is because it's not true. Um, so here's, a, here's an example. Uh, so I should have said, because this is, you know, seminar has computer science in the title, you should feel free to take these to be F2 to the N and F2 to the N. Uh, that's that's a very natural. Uh, case of this question, but if I also take something like, I don't know, G1 and G2 to be the integers, and the integers is not a finite abelian group, but uh, you can generalize the example I'm about to give, uh, then a, an absolutely classic function f would be something like f of x is take x, multiply it by the square root of 2, and then take a floor. Um, so this is a function from the integers to the integers. Um, and if you Ask how often this condition holds. I mean, how often is it true that floor of square root two of x plus y is equal to floor of square root two of x plus floor of square root two of y? Well, I mean, it's it's if and only if the carry bit turns out to be zero, right? You sort of the, the floor function is the same except for the carry bit, and the carry bit is going to be zero or one, and it's going to be zero about half the time. So uh, the probability is about a half. But there's absolutely no homomorphism from the integers to the integers that's close to this, because homomorphisms from the integers to the integers have to be sort of n times x for n integer, and root 2 is not an integer, so uh, there is no, uh, there's no thought. Uh, so, yeah, as naively stated, uh, the statement isn't true. Um, you can fix this, you can repair the statement to sort of take into account these examples, I won't go into that. Uh, all I'll say for the moment is that if uh, f and g actually are f over n, <laughs> x spaces over, over f2, uh, then this is in fact true, uh, the third statement. Um, and uh, I think the first proof, I think, is due to Summer of Nitsky. Temporarily forgotten the date, possibly 2000 and sure. Uh, but uh, yeah, so um, 
statement is true with with some function of uh, of delta on the right hand side, and his proof gives uh, an exponential function of delta uh, on the right hand side. <coughs> so um, yeah. So I wanted to talk about this question. First, I think it's a natural question to ask, like what do one percent homomorphisms look like? Um, and yeah, as, say, as you all probably know much better than I do, this has uh, a sort of natural implications for um, well, this has natural implications for for property testing. If I if I give you a function f and I say, is it a homomorphism? A natural thing to try is to just pull x and y at random and see if the homomorphism condition holds. Um, and this middle statement says, well, obviously if f is linear, then the test always succeeds. Um, and if the test succeeds a lot of the time, then you must have had a function that was pretending to be a, a linear function to start with, that it was almost linear. Um, so, so this tells you that that algorithm is a good one. It identifies functions which are basically linear functions. Um, and this, I mean, yeah, there are lots of cases where you might be interested in functions which pass that test with some, some positive probability in, in the structure of those. Uh, so okay. function of delta means it's independent of the size of the group or something, or? E yes, exactly. So if delta is one over 100, this is still an interesting question. And just by any number here on the right hand side, it's just, just uh, uh, yeah, absolutely. The, the groups will be very, very large and delta should be, you should think of as some fixed number, yeah. Uh, okay, um, cool. So, so that's, uh, that was the motivation. Uh, it's reasonable to ask how did the Samarodnitsky prove this? Uh, and the answer is he used Freiman's theorem. So this is my segue into uh, talking about Freiman's theorem. Or possibly the Freiman Ruger theorem. Um, and this is now the sort of usual way of stating the conjecture I want to talk about, um, but it will turn out to be very closely related to this. So, uh, yeah, so what is. Primus theorem about. So uh, now let, let G just be a, a single Abelian group. Um, again, if you prefer, you can always think of it as F2 to the N. Um, consider other cases too. Uh, and let's suppose I have a finite subset of G. Uh, then I need to define the, the sum set, which you may already know. So a plus A is my notation for take everything in A, take everything else in A, add them together, take the set of all such numbers. Um, so uh, I'll see if I can. We'll attempt to use boards in a non standard way and in failure, but. See how we go. Um, yeah, so uh, so that's the sum set of two finite sets in a abelian group or one finite set. I could also have different sets if you want. Uh, just put a, a minus sign in the appropriate place. If you're working over F2, then obviously it doesn't make any difference. Um, and uh, yeah, so for example, just to make sure we're on the same page, if I take uh, A to be the integers from one to N, then a plus a, when I add any two of these together, I get all of the numbers from two up to two n. Um, and so in particular, the, the size of a plus a is two n minus one, which is roughly speaking two times the size of a. That is very large. Um, okay. Uh, and in general, if I'm interested in the size of the sum set, which I am, uh, then it's not too sort of easy to see that the size of a plus a is, well, it's bounded above by a choose two in the case that all of these pairs are different. Uh, and it's bounded below by the size of a, uh, which you can see by saying, well, fix a1 and then let a2 vary and, and that will be different. Um, and uh, yeah, so to give an example, this example is quite close to this extreme. Uh, I guess another example would just be uh, what if A is a, a subgroup of G? Um, so it's a subgroup. Then uh, um, A plus A is just the same thing back again. And so the uh, uh, size of A plus A is equal to the size of A. 
is yeah, all of the pairs land back in A. Um, and actually, this this completely characterizes the left-hand equality case. So the only sets with A plus A is equal to A are either subgroups or, in fact, closed sets of subgroups. That's also fine. Um, okay, so. Uh, so worked out very well. Um, the, the way I like to think about some sets is that it's an analogy with this sort of 99%, 1% question, but instead of asking for approximate homomorphisms, I'm asking for approximate subgroups. Uh, so I can say A is a subgroup, maybe a coset. Uh, coset of a subgroup that holds if and only if size of A plus A is equal to size of A. I mean, that's an exercise. It's not completely obvious. Um, and, you know, we all know what sets of subgroups look like. Um, I could also then ask, what if A is sort of almost a subgroup? Ninety-nine percent coset or ninety-nine percent subgroup. Well, up to you. Um, and uh, well, that would be sort of by analogy with this, sort of relaxing this condition to say, well, maybe A plus A isn't equal to A, but it's just only a little bit larger. So let's let's say A is sort of almost a subgroup if the size of A plus A is the most one plus epsilon times the size of A, uh, and let's say A is a a one percent subgroup. If uh, the size of A plus A is at most K times A, where again you should think of K, A as being very large and K as being some fixed number like 100. Um, so the natural question is if I have one of these, what do they look like? Um, so, well, in this case, we know what cursors look like. Um, how would you get something where A plus A was only a little bit larger than A? Well, a natural thing you can do is start off with the genuine subgroup and then delete a few of the points. And then when you, so if A is a subgroup, uh, sorry, a subset of H, where H is actually a subgroup, and uh, let's say H is only a little bit larger than A, Then, uh, yeah, when you add A to itself, the worst thing that can happen is that you fill out the whole of H. Um, you can't escape from H because you're contained in a subgroup. And so, yeah, we'll have the size of A plus A is at most the size of A plus H plus H. Some sets behave well with respect to inclusion. Uh, and this is just the size of H. And by hypothesis, H wasn't much larger than A. So this is one way to come up with examples. And as you might guess from social cues, this is the only way to come up with examples. This is if and only if. So anything provided epsilon is at most a half. In fact, uh, anything with uh, this is called the doubling constant. And if the doubling constant is at most three over two, then you're very close to being a genuine subgroup. Um, and is it the same epsilon? Uh, second, sorry? Same epsilon. Uh, as it happens, I think, yes. So the, the strongest statement you can say is that if epsilon is at most a half, then A plus A is a coset of that subgroup. Um, so maybe I should, in fact, have changed this to say uh, coset of H, because in general, it could be a coset. But yeah, then A plus A always floods out the whole coset. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, so it's a, it's a strong statement. Um, okay, and then in the one percent case, if, if a plus a is it's growing quite a lot, but only by a factor of hundred or something, what can you say about a? Um, well, it'd be natural just to say, well, maybe a is not contained in a coset uh, with efficiency one plus epsilon, but maybe it's contained in a, a coset with efficiency some function of delta. So it's uh, so there exists h uh, and x. Such that A is contained in X plus H. H is a subgroup. And uh, the size of um, H is at most some function of delta. Uh, so again, this, this is. Delta is chaos. Oh, sorry, thanks. Some function. 
Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so again, this is this is sort of quite straightforward. It's just like half a page, um, and this is much more complicated. Um, but this is a, this is true. This is a theorem, um, and uh, in this form, it's due to Ruger from 1999, I think. Uh, and uh, well, actually, I should I should caveat that if I'm allowing G to be whatever I want, then it's obviously not a theorem because here's an example of a set A which isn't close to being a finite subgroup of the integers because the only finite subgroup of the integers is the trivial subgroup, uh, but it still has doubling constant two. But again, uh, if we limit G to be F to the N, then you can't come up with examples like this, so it's reasonable to conjecture that, that this is the only way to, uh, to find examples. So, uh, uh, Fred? Yes. Um, feel free to not talk much about this right now, but is there a meaningful uh, theorem you could prove if A plus A has size, let's say, one over K times the maximum A choose two? Like, for example, if I try to mm. contain it from the other end, uh, so it has at least, if it's sort of almost no, no. completely. So, you know, so, so A plus A is still small, but let's say A times smaller than A choose two. I see. Um, yeah, that's a good question. So, uh, almost nothing can be, well, we know almost no statements that apply close to this right hand edge. Um, I think the best, the best way we can say basically anything at all is when you're sort of size of A plus A is uh, size of A to the power of 1.1 or something. Okay. So like polynomially larger than, than the lower bound, but you know still far away from the upper bound. Uh, and that's still very hard. It's still very hard to say almost anything at all at that region. Okay. But uh, yeah, so I think I, I think I remember seeing some uh, pro open problem on someone's open problem list that says in the regime you're talking about where you're not quite at the upper end, yeah. say anything non-trivial. Yeah. Um, and it's it's there, it's probably pretty bad. There are probably some quite generic examples that would get you slightly better than completely spread apart. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, um, but okay, yeah. So let me uh, call this theorem. Uh, so this is called by Ruger, 1999. Um, and I'll just say it sort of builds on work of Freiman uh, from the 1970s. Freiman was only interested in the integer case, and Ruger generalized it to this finite field case. Uh, and this says, uh, yeah, so this statement, let's call it star, star is true in uh, N2PN. Uh, and moreover, you can take this function of k to be uh, k squared times 2 to the k to the 4. Okay. Um, so this is this is not too hard as it happens. It's sort of a couple of pages of, of argument. Uh, you need some sort of clever manipulations, um, but uh, but yeah. So this is a uh, this is the Feynman Ruger theorem, and this this proof uses this theorem as a, as a black box. Kind of funny to put k squared. Like... Uh, it's only because you can write down the bound exactly. I agree. This is where the problem is, and this is just sort of a, a footnote. But uh, but this is this is. Exact. It's not. There are no hidden constants. Uh, um, you really prove uh, a dimension bound like k to the fourth on the, and that follows the size followed from a dimension argument. Right. Ex exactly. So the the you're coming up with this subgroup H, and the real question is what's the the rank of what's the dimension of H, and it's bigger than the sort of in quotation marks dimension of A by by a factor of about k to the fourth. Um, so uh, yeah. So um. Uh, yeah, so this is sort of an answer to the question, um, but it's also reasonable to ask in both of these questions, what's the best f you can come up with? Like, what's the quantitative dependency of of this number f of k on, on k or this number f of delta on delta? Um, and this is exponential, which is not great. We don't like theorems of exponential bounds. It limits what you can do with it. Um, and so it's natural to ask, could you replace this with just a polynomial bound? Uh, for this theorem, the answer is no. Um, and there's a fairly straightforward example. So suppose I have A to be E1 up to EN in F2 to the N. So these are the, the basis vectors in the standard basis. Um, then, well, the, the doubling constant 
uh, as they will say, is well, they do all spread out. You get n choose two uh, elements when you add them together, but that's like n plus one over two times the size of a. Um, and uh, however, the the most efficient way I can contain a in a coset is by saying something like a is contained in e one plus span of e two up to e n. Or, or symmetrically. This is the most efficient way you can contain A in a coset. And this has size 2 to the n bigger than uh, than A. So even though the doubling constant was only a size n, the efficiency of containing A in a subgroup is uh, exponential in N. So that's that's pretty sad. And then if this example offends you because it's so small, you can sort of blow it up until you get a big example. Um, so uh, yeah, so as stated, uh, <laughs> Can't be better than that. Um, but uh, that's really just because the statement is kind of bad. Um, rather than containing A inside one coset uh, of a, a subgroup of G, um, there's an idea by Kathleen Martin that says, what if you just contain A in some number of cosets of a, a subgroup? So you contain it in a, a few cosets. Um, so Uh, so, yeah, let's say if A plus A so is K times A, maybe it's true that there exists uh, some subgroup H and some collection of cosets uh, of H such that A is contained in this union of XI plus H. Um, and, uh, H and M are not too large. So actually I can ask for H is at most A. If it's bigger, just make it a bit smaller and then take more cosets. Uh, and M is at most uh, K to the C1. Um, so yeah, once you fix this, the formulation in this way, then it's reasonable to ask for polynomial bounds. There are no obvious counter examples. Um, this is analogous to have a list of uh, homomorphisms in the one percent case. In the... Right. So yes. So here you might ask not just to agree with a single homomorphism one percent of the time, but to have a list of homomorphisms which cover everything, which should explain all the values. Yeah. Um, or maybe a list of homomorphisms and also then translates of those homomorphisms or something like that. Uh, yeah. So I guess I should have stated the analogous conjecture. Um, let's call this conjecture one. It's conjecture two, which is that in this uh, homomorphism problem, uh, you can take uh, f of delta at least delta to the c two uh, in problem whatever this problem is called. Let's pull it back out. Um, and uh, yeah, as I've been hinting at, these conjectures are equivalent. So this is not completely straightforward, but given modern tools and analytic combinatorics, uh, this statement and this statement and many other statements, <clears throat> excuse me, of the same kind, uh, are it's hard, much easier to show to deduce from each other than they are to prove any one of them. So uh, any one of these statements gets to be called the, the polynomial prime integer conjecture. So Fred, yeah, uh, it appears to me that a natural version would have been that you allow a different age for each xi, as in like, you know, you just try to cover um, A with the uh, smallest number of different cosets. Uh -huh. You don't have the cosets of the same group. Hmm. Uh, somehow you're saying that you can actually take cosets of the same group in the conjecture, right? Right, so, so it's a little sensitive to exactly how you formulate the question, because I'm formulating it in terms of some sets, wherever my some sets have gone. Um, if I took different subgroups, like very different subgroups, then that wouldn't have small doubling because when you add any two of them together, it's going to expand hugely. So that wouldn't be a nice if and only if statement. Okay. Um, think, but if I had more of a sort of, so as I would say this, that there are other ways you could have stated the question. For example, you could say, take two elements in A, add them together. What's the probability that it ends up back in A? And then you would probably have to do something like you described because you could have different pieces that don't talk to each other. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes. Is it somehow equivalent to just 
finding one coset that covers like a lot of it, like the polynomial fraction? Yes, that's a, that's a great question. So uh, another equivalent statement is that there is a single coset whose intersection with A is polynomially large in terms of delta. And again, it's none of these implications are totally obvious, but there's a covering argument you can use also due to Ruja uh, that says if you can capture a little bit of A, then you can cover the whole of A efficiently as well. Yes. Uh, yes. If do this any abelian. Uh, oh, sorry, no. So here I uh, thank you. I should have said this conjecture is when G is F2 to the N, or I mean, if you allow the implied constant to depend on, on P, then, then the conjecture is reasonable for any, any FP to the N or any group of bounded torsion, I guess. Uh, there, there are no obvious counterexamples. Yeah, thank you. So in conjecture two there, you're allowing several homomorphisms or? Uh, in conjecture two, I'm taking one homomorphism one. and I'm asking for it to account for a positive proportion of the, okay. uh, of the values of that. And again, you could you could do a covering argument if you wanted to say that means you can bootstrap it and account for all of the values of most of the values of that. Um, yeah, so if, I, I'm not going to list every variation of these conjectures. I think it's fair to say that in all cases, they're either false or there's a, a known proof. Um, and, and all of the equivalences come with polynomial uh, losses. So, so you can choose your favorite one out of a long list and, and think about that. Okay. Um, uh, okay, yeah, so to, just to give a very quick idea of why these things might be equivalent, how these reductions might go, um, if you know conjecture one and you want to deduce conjecture two, uh, well, you can do something like, so conjecture one implies conjecture two, uh, consider something like, take your function f, which I just rubbed out, and uh, Look at its graph. So, so in the abelian group, do you want cross G two? Consider the graph of F, um, and this doesn't exactly have small doubling. Um, so, you'd like to say that uh, that this set has small doubling uh, with some k depending on delta. Uh, that's not quite true. What you actually get is this the statement that the probability of Rex and Y of uh, X plus Y is in gamma, where X and Y in gamma is at least, actually probably just literally delta. Um, and then the question is, can you get from this weaker hypothesis the stronger or this seemingly unrelated hypothesis? And, and the answer is sort of, Yes, provided you know enough additive combinatorics, and in this case, you'd need something called the, the bowel summary to Gauss theorem. Um, but it's at least plausible that if you can prove this, then, then it will tell you something about that. Um, okay, so the, the main thing I wanted to tell you about um, well, uh, oh, first of all, so. For this, for, for this polynomial from Rouge conjecture, I gave you an exponential bound and then said, can you prove a polynomial bound? Uh, and something in between was proved by, by Saunders in 2012. Um, so he showed that you can take M to be at most, uh, let me see, E to the O of log to the fork. So this is quasi-polynomial. It's not as good as polynomial. It's much better than exponential. Uh, and then I think in Yagin, in sort of unpublished work that was quoted by Saunders, showed that you can improve this uh, log to the three with log to the four with log to the three plus with log. So it's slightly better quasi-polynomial. Obviously, if you could place the three by one, then you'd feel pretty good. Um, and uh, yeah, the thing was I want to to describe is um, it's not on this yet, uh, which says that uh, this conjecture is true. Um, 
and moreover, this this implied constant that you can uh, that you have c one the the power of k that you take. Um, we don't know exactly what it is, but you can take c one to be twelve. Um, so it, it's not some catastrophically huge number. Uh, so so yeah, it'll be one. Uh, I think we know that it's slightly bigger than one, um, but I think as far as I know, it could be two or one, uh, one and a half or something like that. Um, yeah, we uh, lower bounds are pretty surprisingly hard to come by. Um, okay, uh, yeah, so maybe I should have said something about applications. So um, and I want to say something if I can about how, how the proof of this goes. So. Um, maybe I'll just say it out loud. So there are applications within additive combinatorics. Yeah. One of the statements this is equivalent to is the inverse theorem for the U3 norm, which has lots of interesting applications, some interesting applications. Uh, there are also computer science applications. Um, I've talked about property testing. Uh, there are also things to do with uh, two-source randomness extraction. Um, and uh, also, I think, the log-rank conjecture for communication complexity. Uh, whether there are results, interesting results about those that depend on the polynomial Feynman Ruger conjecture, I think is a function of time and it's not necessarily monotone. So uh, there are cases where the best results depended on PFR and then someone managed to prove them independently of PFR. Um, but it's at least a nice thing to know. And uh, the way those applications usually go is to say, well, I have a statement I'd like to be true, but it fails because there's some bad structured counterexample. So, you know, my result would be true except charts, you know, if I have a subgroup, then, then it fails. Uh, and then you get to say, well, okay, like, I know what to do for subgroups, like, my, my big theorem is still true for subgroups, uh, so, but my lemma is false, so let's split into two cases, one way you look a bit like a subgroup, and then I know what to do, and, <clears throat> and one way you look nothing like a subgroup, and then, then the lemma is true. Uh, and, uh, yeah, because you get to take a very weak structural result, sort of statistical structure, and upgrade it to a very strong structural result, which is an algebraic structure. This is sort of the difference between that argument being had wavy nonsense and being an actual proof. Um, and the quality of the bound obviously depends on whether it's any good for you. And polynomial bounds is sort of the best we can hope for. Does it give you anything for list decoding? Or does it give you better? I barely list know what that word means, so I, I don't, I'm not qualified to answer. No, but you, you, that's how you want to, this is, you know, because they are equivalent, there is a list decoding analog. Okay, and you look at the conjecture too. You okay. get a list of uh, homomorphisms. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so if if you can phrase this statement in terms of list decoding, then the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But is it immediate though? I mean, like, you know, you get a list size, it's not clear that you get a list size count because that in principle could be different cosets. Like multiple cosets could potentially be. Satisfying the well, this would be okay. It's a list. The, the, yeah, the, there is a bootstrap version where you get to to cover your function. Well, your function might be random garbage, but you can say, you know, I can describe my function as some part which is random garbage and then some part which is accounted for by each of the following homomorphisms. Okay. So yeah, there, there are covering statements of that flavor. Right, but but uh, the number of uh, things you require, like number of possible uh, homomorphisms that could cover your function, is that like some fixed bound? Uh I think it would depend on depends on delta, uh, but it should be polynomial in delta. Uh, okay. That, that, I'm fairly sure that statement is true. If you ask me where it's written down, I'm not quite sure. Okay. But, yeah. Um, yeah. One more question. Yeah. While I have paused. Uh, so this statement works for f two to the n, f three to the n at the moment, like the the main theorem. Uh, oh, so the main theorem. Uh, thank you. So so this is for uh, f two to the n. Okay. And I believe the case of f p to the n, or in fact any bounded torsion group, is 2024 plus plus. So okay. we should be able to extend our methods to that regime. Okay, great. Um, with another constant. With a yeah, constant depending in some non-trivial way on, on P or on M. Yeah. Oh, the torsion. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, okay. So uh where's that? So uh yeah, so I don't have some time to try and give you uh, don't don't uh, rush. I mean you oh, okay. take uh, 10, 15 minutes more. Okay, thank you. Um so yeah, so I want to give you some some flavor of how this proof goes. Uh, so so the first idea is uh, I don't think this has a 
an attribution. I think this idea will have occurred to many people who thought about this problem, uh, which is that, I mean, there are two things you could try. One is you take your, your set and you try and find all of the structure in one go. You say, great, I found, I found my H. Uh, I figured out how to cover it with cosets of H. I'm done. Uh, the other thing you could try is a sort of iterative approach. So you say, okay, I found a set A with, uh, with small doubling. Um, can I find somehow uh, a set A prime where in some fuzzy sense, A prime and A are sort of loosely connected to each other um, such that A prime has smaller doubling. So if you can improve this k to k to the power 0 0.99, uh, then you can iterate this, right? You start with uh, a naught, and then somehow that's related to a1, uh, and then somehow that's related to a2. And uh, eventually that's somehow related to an. And if this doubling constant is going down at this rate, then very, very rapidly you'll end up with something that's has doubling constant 1.1 or something, and we know that those things are very close to subroots. So this will just be equal to uh, some coset as a subgroup H. Um, yeah, where, where this arrow means like related to, and you want some quantitative notion of related to with sort of parameter, whatever that means, sort of case. Um, so, uh, yeah, so this is a sort of doubling decrement. Idea, rather than looking for all of your structure at once, just try and make it a little bit better until you've made it so much better that the structure is obvious. Um, okay, and obviously I haven't told you what I'm planning on putting in here. Um, and uh, the answer is nothing because, as stated, this we can't make this work. Um, and the problem is roughly that the doubling constant k is a, a really unpleasant parameter to optimize over. It's, it's very rough. Uh, when you take a plus a, and then you take the size of the, of, yeah, the size of the sum sets, sort of somehow a number could be represented as a1 plus a2 in one ways or in n ways, and you don't distinguish. So it's very rough. It's sort of got the sharp cutoff between is in a plus a and is not in a plus a. Uh, and it, it just makes it very hard to work with. So um, say. Styles because uh, because some sets are easily rough. Well, by rough I mean the opposite of smooth. Um, <laughs> you sort of want to do an optimization problem, and, and uh, okay, so I can solve that problem. So this is idea two. Uh, and this this idea goes back to um, probably Terry Town in 2010. Uh, and that's to say, okay, rather than taking the size of the sum set, um, I'm going to I'm going to do two things. So one is I'm going to take I'm going to reformulate the polynomial Freiman Ruge conjecture again, rather than making it a statement about sets in some abelian group G1 G. Uh, I'm going to make it a statement about probability distributions on. Of G. So X is going to be a random variable uh, on G. And the example to bear in mind is where X is the uniform distribution on A. So choose an element of A at random, EG. Uniform distribution. Okay. Um, so I now need to generalize. The notion of sort of additive structure from subsets to random variables. Um, so instead of saying what's the size of the sum set a plus a, uh, well, uh, what's the natural analog of the, the sum set for random variables? Well, let's say take two independent copies of x and then add them together. So let's take x1 plus x2, where x1 and x2 are independent copies uh, of x. And then rather than taking the size of that set, I should take some measure of the size of this probability distribution and the natural one is Shannon entropy. Uh, so H here is Shannon entropy, 
one would argue that the Rene entropy is more like I mean, this idea is much older than Terry and uh, much older than 2010. Terry is involved even in the early 2000s and the computer science was natural to look at probability distribution anyway. And uh, I think both Rene entropy and uh, Shannon entropy were used. We favor Rene, but I don't know what you are going to do. Uh, I'm going to use Shannon. Yeah. Um, okay, so I can, I can caveat this to saying that this was developed. Um, yeah, yeah. So, no, so it, not, not taking any credit from that. Yeah. So, so Terry did quite a lot of work on this formulation, showing that you can pass backwards and forwards in those sort of statements. So he sort of fleshed out a lot of the details, um, and some of those are not trivial. Uh, yeah, so but we, I am going to use Shannon entropy. If I can't promise that it doesn't work with running entropy, but it definitely works very nicely for Shannon entropy. Um, so, and yeah, the natural hypothesis is that the Shannon entropy goes up by some little k, uh, where k you should think of as being about log of big k. Never mind. Well, Shannon entropy is. Oh, yes, uh, I can. Um, thank you. So, it's not bad when I ignore it. Um, this, uh, so, yeah, so the Shannon entropy, H of a random variable, is the sum over X in its support uh, of PS of X times the log of one of um, so it's probability log probability. Okay, yep, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, so it's a natural notion of size, um, and you know, it's backwards compatible in the sense that the entropy of a uniform distribution is log of the log of the support. Um, it's, it's, like a, it's a very general thing in analysis, right? Like if you want to iterate something to like like do some solid inequality or something like this, and then move to some other functional space, and then I mean, it's just a very general principle. Yeah, yeah. So I'm not listing this as a big idea. Yeah. Um, this is somewhere in between a sort of technical reduction and being an important technical reduction. Right. And I think it's an important technical reduction because we really can't make it work without doing this. But but yeah, I agree. This isn't the sort of this isn't the knockout idea that that makes it all work. Um, but it it helps much more than you think. Um, so. Uh, yeah, so so in particular, um, this allows me to to rephrase my entire problem. Um, uh, oh, so one useful useful definition. So if I have two different random variables, I can sort of adapt this notion of small entropic doubling uh, to what's called the entropic Ruffy distance. Uh, Uh, which is basically if I have two random variables x and y, then the, the Ruger distance between them is what you get by taking the entropy of x minus y um, and saying that should be not too much larger than the average of the entropies of x and y. So this is this is a non-negative quantity. Uh, and if I were to take d of x minus x, I would just get this k. Um, and in general, you can, you can define this for any pair of random variables. Um, and so the, the entropy analog of um, the uh, original polynomial well, Feynman-Rich conjecture would be to say, so for any uh, random variables x and y and g with uh, entropic Ruger distance between them is most k, um, then uh, there exists some subgroup such that the entropic Ruger distance between X and the uniform distribution on H is uh, small and uh, bounded above by some constant times K where the constant turns out to be a lot. So this is a very similar statement to Palmer and Fanrich conjecture. If you start out with okay, now a pair of random variables with sort of small joint doubling, then there exists a genuine subgroup such that they're close to that subgroup. The only thing is that the notion of you know covering by coat sets has been replaced by this Ruger distance. But I promise that you can go from one to the other uh, with polynomial losses. So uh, yeah, this is a sort of entropic formulation of the original problem, and and it's a good one. So.
so you can fact, we only need one direction, but but both directions are true. So yes. isn't this a little misleading to call it, call it this a distance because you know dxx is ah thank you yeah yeah that's a good point so uh, it is misleading to call it a distance we do it anyway um, <laughs> in fact as you point out the, the distance between x and x is zero if and only if x is equal to the uniform distribution on some subgroup h so it, it obeys but it does obey the triangle inequality that's useful so um uh, but yes it's uh, it's a quasi distance or something. Uh, yeah, but a point can be very far from itself. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, does it still satisfy the triangle inequality? Yeah, it does. It's 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 uh, it's, it's a short argument. Um, I mean, in the entropy world, really the only things you can do are use the submodularity property of entropy, take conditional, you know, condition on on other random variables, and I mean that's really about it. Uh, and so the the fact that this obeys the triangle inequality has a proof which is a short combination of those ingredients, yeah. Um, okay, uh, so that's that's the entropy reformulation. Oh, right, and uh, I can reformulate my idea one as idea one prime that says given x and y with root of distance uh, k, find x prime and y prime with uh, root of distance between x prime and y prime at most 0.99k and uh, x and x prime are closely related and y and y prime are closely related in the sense that these are at most 100k. So this would be the optimization version where I say starting with x and y, can I improve them? Can I find better ones? It's confusing because this distance is playing both the role of the objective function, the thing we're trying to minimize, and also the thing that keeps track of how far you've moved away. Um, so, so this is what I mean by, okay, x and x prime are kind of similar-ish. It means that they're both root distance. And, and root distance does both jobs, which is, is weird. Um, okay, but if you can prove this, then you won't quite prove the theorem I've stated because these numbers don't give you 12 or 11, but it'll prove this with you know 11 replaced by 200 or something. So I think that's, this is the way to think about it. I cannot do it. What is the D x prime y prime smaller than what? Uh, sorry, 0 0.99 ah. times k. Yeah, slightly smaller than k. Thank you. Um, uh, okay, I'm short of time. So uh, there are then two further crucial ideas. Um, so this idea one prime does work in the end as opposed to the idea one itself? Yeah, so th this is literally, well, this isn't how the paper writes it, but you could write the paper exactly this way. It's a true statement. Um, you just get a worse than this. You know, literally like this rather than basically like this. Yeah. Uh, yes. So, so, so the, let's say you keep doing this. Uh, where does this subgroup come in at the end? Oh, yeah, thank you. So it comes in here. So uh, you keep doing this for so long until the, the quality of the, the original distance gets basically to zero. Um, so you have two choices. You can either wait until it's very, very close to zero and then use some stability result. Uh, or you can actually just iterate it forever and use compactness. It's uh, um, so the, the only thing you need to know about ultimate is uh, um, okay. So eventually you get the like the middle point would, would be a subgroup that's close to both. Exactly. So, so when you run this for a very long time, then you'll get you know x prime and x prime prime and x prime 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 and so on. The last one of those will literally be uh, the uniform distribution on a subgroup, and then you just add up the distance bounds as you as you go back. Um, yeah, so that's that's where your, your structure develops very, very gradually, and then uh, you don't see anything at all until you've, you've gotten to the, to the end. Um, yeah. Um, okay, so... Yeah. So, I mean, this leaves open the big question, how do you improve X and Y to slightly better X's and Y's? What's the, uh, what's the improvement tool? How does it improve? X and Y. Um, and at least one of the crucial ideas that you can uh, that you can use to do this is to, and the slogan is that uh, distance or homomorphisms improve structure. So here's the, the general statement. Uh, if I have uh, X and Y being random variables on, on G1, 
and uh, pi is a homomorphism from G1 to G2, then I start out with knowing the, the sort of entropic doubling constant between X and Y. And I'm going to compare that to two things. One is the entropic doubling constant I get when I just evaluate pi at X and X and Y. So push forward these random variables under pi uh, and say, well, okay, what's well, now the doubling constant? Sort of, uh, oh. My picture. So, so if here's my big group, uh, and here's X, here's Y, the random variables in the big group, and then I plot pi, then I'll get random variables pi X and pi Y on uh, on the on G two, and I can look at the the doubling constant between them. Um, and another thing I can do is I can fix elements A and B uh, that are in G2 and take the fiber. So these are uh, all of the elements with pi of G is equal to A. Um, and I can take the conditional random variable. So X conditioned on pi of X is A, and here is Y is conditioned on pi of Y is A. So I start out with a random variable, I look at projecting it down, I look at taking the fibers, and then I'll like average over A. And the dilemma says that the right hand side is better than the left hand side. So So yeah. Whenever you apply a homomorphism and take the base and take the fibers, this inequality goes the correct way around, that these things are, are better than what you started with. And you want the second term to be a fixed one? Uh, oh, no. So, yeah. So, how would I apply this? So, the, the, the crucial, crucial way that this is applied is not to apply original random variables x and y, but to take two copies of x and y, and then Take the homomorphism uh, obtained by adding them together. So we'll use uh, the homomorphism pi from g cross g to g, sending x1, x2 to uh, x1 plus x2. So as you keep doubling, the doubling constant is going down. So, uh, yeah, so, so what we'll get is that, uh, so I'm going to take a random variable on G cross G, which is just two copies of X1. Um, and I'll get the distance from two copies of X1 to two copies of Y, copies of X to two copies of Y. Uh, this is just twice the distance from X to Y because it's just dependent. Uh, and then this is going to be at least the sum of two terms uh, where the first one I can write down quite easily. It's uh, X1 plus X2. Uh, and then this is some average just a time out. You can fill in what goes down there. Um, and the, the, so this is two times K. And that tells you that one of these must be at most K, right? So uh, either you can improve X and Y by passing to these random variables, or you can improve them by passing to these random variables. Um, and, uh, or, or equality holds and you don't get an improvement at all. But uh, there's sort of only one case left where you don't get an improvement. And that's where everything in this argument that I've just written down is, is equality. Um, so I think I can finally say, and then I'll run out of time. Uh, okay, I'm ready. But idea four is what to do um, in the equality case. So, um, okay, so you using Markov or something like for the second one, but for this, yeah. Oh yeah. So, um, yeah. So, so you would select an A and B that, uh, such that these condition random variables, uh, do what you want. Yeah. Um, so it's a bit more complicated because you also have to keep track of the distance between X and this condition thing. 
and then you have to average both of those quantities with Markov. But but then yeah, you sort of Markov pigeonhole whatever you want to call it to choose a good at a and a good b. Um, yeah. So okay. So the only case I have now to worry about is when this fails. Um, what can you say about x and y if this improvement mechanism doesn't work? Um, it would be really great if you could say, well, ah, if, if this improvement mechanism fails, that means that X and Y are already very, very structured. They already look like cosets of subgroups or something. Unfortunately, we know that can't be true because the theorem isn't true if you replace F2 to the N with the integers. And so far, there is absolutely no way that I've used the fact that I'm working over F2 to the N. Uh, so this is a, there is a sort of specialized end game um, that only works um, in... Uh, and have to do the n. Uh, and I think I won't try and write down in detail what it does. Um, basically, you. Um, okay, so here's how I would describe it. When this equality holds, you end up learning quite a lot about the entropies of lots of quantities. So you sort of know um, the entropy of, you know, x1 minus x2. And if you want, you can also find out the entropy of x1 plus x2 and uh, all of these various things. Um, and they end up being quite rigid. They sort of, if you if you want to know, they sort of look like what you would get if you put in a Gaussian random variable over the reals or something. That's that's sort of the only thing that they can be doing. Um, and then at some point, you notice that if you're working over f2 to the n, these would have to be equal to each other because x1 plus x2 and x1 minus x2 are the same variable. Um, and for Gaussians, that's sort of not true in some circle. Because that exact one is true, but for some right, yeah, the, um, yeah, that, that, uh, two things are meant to be non-equal that would be forced to be equal if you're working over F2 to the N, and that sort of collapses the whole house of cards and shows you that this very interesting equality case that we've sort of learned lots about can't happen over F2 to the N, and, and all you can have over F2 to the N is the structured case. So over F2 to the N, uh, this forces, um, well, what it ultimately forces is that we can find uh, some random variable z such that z is sort of well, if dz z was zero, it would be forced to be a coset of a subgroup. In fact, sort of think of it as it's sort of much much closer to being a subgroup than you first thought. Um, so uh, yeah, I think I'll I'll avoid saying anything else about that end game. Um, I will just say if you want to prove this rep p to the end, this is where you come unstuck. Obviously, everything else goes through. Uh, but your endgame no longer works because you can't just replace the plus with the minus. Um, and uh, so you need a new endgame, and that's why one of these is on the archive and the other isn't. <laughs> okay, and I should stop that because I'm way over time. Uh, and uh, yeah. Uh, all right. Before we uh, question, I just want to mention the Friday deals till Thursday or even Friday, and uh, you can talk to him, send him email or whatever. And uh, yeah, questions to Freddy. So even though the end game doesn't work, you, you think it's, it's going to work and it's oh, true yeah. and everything. We know, sorry, we know exactly how to do it. We're just still, okay. uh, still polishing it up. But uh, um, it's... Uh, it's maybe there are probably many ways to do it the way we know to do it. The only difficulty is that you have to replace this sort of what's the entropy of x minus y or something with what's the entropy of n random or p random variables. So you have to start working with you know entropy of x1 plus x2 plus x3 plus x4 up to xp. Uh, and then you sort of run the other arguments. Uh, and then now instead of sort of plus one and minus one, you get to look at x, two times x, three times x, four times x, up to p times x, and then you do get enough to sort of cancel things off. Um, and uh, but, but yeah, somehow it, it's it's a strange game to be playing. It's that you're sort of trying to write down enough things that you get to see that p is zero. Um, and uh, But you need to write down a lot more things because p is a much larger number, so you need more random variables in play in order to sort of catch out the coincidence that, that uh, that's true over fp to the n, but not over the integers, say. Uh, but yeah, if the end game exists, it's just it complicates the whole of the rest of the argument because you need to beef everything up. Yeah. So you focus on the end game, but actually I'm 
quite curious about the intuition for this uh, doubling. So you are starting to improve your situation. Let's say we are not in the end game. There's two, two possibilities. Either when you are doubling X, uh, the doubling constant of this new distribution goes down, mm -hmm. or some conditional random variable. I don't even know what G2 is. Maybe it's the same as G1. Uh, yes, sorry, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's G. Yeah. yeah, it's G. Yeah. So, um, yeah, why, why should one of these have uh, some generic case, some, you know, not end game case? So, so either a conditional uh, distance shrink or the, or the doubling constant. Right. So I can certainly give examples where you can see why this is reasonable. Yeah. So one example is take X to be the uniform distribution on a dense subset of a subgroup. So uh, you, you know, to start with a subgroup, sample half the points at random. And now X1 plus X2 will basically will be much closer to uniform on the subgroup, right? It'll smooth everything out. Yeah. And so the, the distance will go down. So that's that's a great case. Um, another case is where you have, um, well, let's say you take the subgroup and then you take like e to the k random cosets of it, and you take the uniform distribution on the union of those cosets. Um, so now, like the subgroup is is happy, but you've taken you've spread out too much. This thing will then the conditional random variable of x one given x one plus x two basically has the effect of zooming in on one of the cosets. So it's sort of a, a random choice. You, you choose A, how many ways can you get X for 1 plus X2 equals A? Well, if these cosets are sort of dissociated, then there's only one way to get A as one coset plus another coset. Uh, and so you, you zoom in on that, that pair. Um, and so that helps you a lot in the case that you're sort of spread out. Um, and, but these two cases are sort of opposite to each other. There are the cases where you want to spread out, and there are the cases where you want to shrink. And if you do the wrong one, then your life gets worse. Uh, so if you if you add in the second case, then it's horrible. And if you shrink in the first case, it makes life even worse. Um, so there's sort of intention. And somehow it just turns out that on average, the average of the two of them is, is still an improvement. Um, and I, I can't really tell you why that is. I mean, it, the proof is so short that in some sense, I should just say, look at the proof. And, and that tells you why it's true. Um, it, it's, it really is just, uh, I mean, you can actually, so we actually write down explicitly what the what the, the remainder term is, and it's just some mutual information between some random variables. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It, it's it's nice. That's all I can say, really. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, your evil cases are the ones which are sort of perfectly in tension between random subsets and uh, uh, and things that have too many cosets. Um, but and I think that idea has also been around for a long time. Uh, I think Nets Katz had a whole thing where he called things like this sort of smoothing because they like spreading out, and it's like this sort of non-smoothing. And it, yeah, it, it's a, it's an natural it's natural to see this kind of dichotomy in that. And, but it, it is a function of Shannon entropy that it, you get to have this nice inequality. So to to bring it back, I think if you use Randy entropy, I don't know whether this thing yes, is so. true. Yeah. More questions. What does equality case refer to? Uh, sorry, equality in this. So, equivalently in, in, in well, actually it means several things. It means that this inequality has an equality, and also that this has this number is k, and basically all of these numbers are k. It's not also bad whenever it's very close to equality? Oh, yeah. So, I, sorry. So, okay. thank you. So, uh, I should really have said the uh, near. Equality case. So in the, the actual equality case, you get to replace this with zero. Um, so in the equality case, over F2 to the N, it forces you to be close to something which is literally just a coset of a subgroup. But then once you start putting in fudge factors, you can just say that this is quite small. Uh, and there are there are multiple steps in here. Okay, great. Thank you.